Welcome to episode number 35 of Life Without Cravings. So today I'm having another guest with me. Her name is Sally and she's a carnivore since two years back. And first of all, she has Hashimoto's and she also showed me a list of all the conditions and symptoms that she has healed in the last two years. But I wanted to have her on this show because she is also... As she described it, she's the worst kind of sugar addict. It was her addiction to sugar and carbs that got her into the trouble in the first place. So without further ado, let's hop into the interview and hear what Sally has to say. Hey, welcome to the show, Sally. So good to Hi, you. thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, um, so I know that some people may be familiar with you, but not everyone. You are one of the coaches in the steak and butter gang, but for yeah. those of you who are watching or listening who are not familiar with Sally we just want to kind of dig into your story a little bit and if you can just tell us about like your the early days of your sugar addiction and where you think that that came from and you know if you remember how it started and why and how it developed over time (laughs) that was a lot of information (laughs) you go (laughs) a lot of information (laughs) yeah yep when um when I was a kid there were, I mean, I didn't care about food at all. I didn't give a crap. I was skinny. I just, food didn't mean anything to me. And somewhere, I was like around 10 years old, there's things that happened to me that um, I didn't remember. I did not remember them. I guess my brain's way of coping was, you know, to block it all out. And I went in, I ended up living with my dad and my stepmom and that's when food became an issue. It became, um, a control issue for me and control. If anyone knows about trauma, it's like, you have to control everything. You have to control your life, your, your safety, your just everything about you. And at that time it was, you couldn't just like, if you wanted to snack, you couldn't just have food. You couldn't just go in the fridge and have an apple or, or a cookie or whatever you couldn't, um, because I mean, we had a six kids of us living there. And so money was tight and we ate at mealtime and, and that's a great thing. Um, but it became such a focus. The focus was on food and, and our bodies too. Cause my, um, step siblings, my stepmom, I mean, they were very tiny and I was very skinny, but I had larger bone structure. And so it was a comparison and my stepmom made me very aware of the foods I ate, the, um, what I shouldn't eat, what I should eat, what would cause me to gain weight. And I never thought at all about weight at all. And so I became very aware. I started, um, eating things I shouldn't maybe rebellion. I don't know. Um, and at one point I was like, well, I'm going to eat this. I'm going to eat it. And then <laughs> we're gonna throw it up you know and I became bulimic um and that was with me for a few years but my stepmom was kind of smart she realized what I was doing and she had this conversation with me about food and it wasn't about she didn't want me to know she was didn't want me to connect the dots so she talked to me about you know when you're you know, when we get sick or whatever. And she goes, yeah, you know, because you get sick and you, yeah, oh, you think you can eat and then you throw everything up. And she goes, but luckily for the body, she goes, it's smart. And she goes, it still absorbs all those nutrients. It still absorbs everything. Oh, and I I'm in my, I know I'm in my brain. I'm going, what? I'm throwing it all up and I'm still absorbing the sugar, the, all this stuff. I'm still going to get fat. And so I, it stopped. It's, I mean, not completely. I mean, it did hit me later on when I was smart enough to know that that wasn't real Mm -hmm. completely. Um, but for the most part, you know, I stopped at that point and, um, but the, it never like the, the focus on food at that point, the focus on my body, um, the body dysmorphia I had that started then, um, and blew way out of proportion. Yeah. It just, um, it was not a great, (laughs) <laughs> it was not a great way to start my, um, I want to say my life at that point, because, um, before that it was like my parents were, you know, they fought all the time. It, it was, um, a very, very tumultuous childhood. 
So when they get divorced, it was that it became even like as with anyone with divorce, it just, you know, went a little crazy. And um, then the, my step siblings and I thought, wow, this family now family, lots of brothers and sisters. And, but that it just, everything turned into control at that point. So. Okay. So were you aware of you having a problem at this point? Um, no, not really. Not really. That didn't come until after my marriage, after when I got married, because I was, I was young and, yeah. um, but I was very, very mature. Um, like I was, I think I was, um, five years old in first grade, you know, so I was 16 when I was a senior and, um, yeah. I got married, I think it was 18. It was a year after I graduated. So I graduated 17, got married 18, had my daughter at 20. And there were the parts of the trauma that uh, I didn't understand. I didn't even know I'd been traumatized. Um, but things, certain touches, certain things with my husband and I would just freeze, you know, and I didn't understand why. And he'd be like, what the F is wrong with you? <laughs> you know? And I just, I didn't know. I, I did not know what was going on with me. Um, but because of those things, he went and had an affair and, um, during when that happened that was traumatic alone in that and in the middle of that trauma I remembered everything everything it was back in my mind as if it had never left and all of a sudden I have all these memories and I'm like and and so many things made sense after that not everything some some things just come up in the past year um that I would remember why certain things bothered me but um I don't know I completely lost my train of thought, um, but right. it, it was at that point when I started to try and bury my emotions, because of course now I'm remembering all this stuff. Mm. And it wasn't just that before that, it wasn't trying to bury, I didn't actually have the feeling. I didn't know why I reacted in certain ways, but it wasn't the emotions. It wasn't until after all this uh, came back into my head and my, my memories that then I was trying to bury and I buried well. Um, I did not want to feel anything and I used sugar to do it. And it wasn't just like pizzas and pastries and all that. It was bags of candy. It was pure, pure sugar. And yes, I ate those other things too, but most of the time there was no like real food, real meal food involved. Um, just bags, um, cabaret eggs, M&Ms. Um, and, and, and when my sugar load got so high, I would have to get chips. Now, I'm not a chip person, but it'd have to be put the salt in yes. and then it would be sugar and then salt and then sugar. And I go back and forth and back and forth for hours. I can so relate then, to that. You just need like, I had enough sugar. I need some salt and then I can go back to the sugar again. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what this went on for years. And I would, like I told you before, I, I would go in the grocery store and I would imagine how the food, I'd look at the food and be like, okay, imagine what it tastes around my tongue. What does it feel like? What does it taste like? Okay, I can do that in the cart. It would go. And if I couldn't do that, I didn't put it in the cart. And I went through the entire grocery store doing this and had a huge cart of food and be like, I can't bring this home. I got to start tomorrow. I can start my diet tomorrow. I can't bring this home, but I couldn't put it back. So it came home and I would eat. I didn't gorge. It wasn't, I mean, I binged because of what I was eating and the, and just all kinds of different things, but I didn't like gorge food. I couldn't have a large volume of food. And, but I would eat enough and then all in the trash, it would go hundreds of dollars worth of stuff in the trash. It would go starting again tomorrow. And I'd start fresh and within 24 hours, those cravings would hit so bad. I'm back at the grocery store doing the same thing. And I did this for year, decades, actually. And it wasn't until maybe five years ago that I, I sought out an addiction therapist because I knew I'm like, I can't give this up no matter what I tried. It controlled every second of every minute of every hour of every day every thought 
was, what am I going to have? What can I have? When can I have it? When I get home, what am I going to do? And it affected everything I did or didn't do. It affected who I would see. Yeah. And my weight would go up and down by 50 to 100 pounds. We're not talking 10, 20 pounds. It would be up and down, up and down. I'm like, wow. every time someone hadn't seen me for a year or two, you never knew. Was I skinny last time or was I huge? And it, it was, it controlled me. And <laughs> here comes the sun. Yeah. <laughs> it, it controlled me. And um, I didn't know how to break that. And it wasn't until I found carnivore because I tried everything like most people I did. And they all work. You can lose yeah, weight. Yeah. You just try yeah, yeah. yourself. Um, what was the tipping point here? What, what was it that made something switch in your brain to just start actually looking for help? Because I, f I feel like a lot of the time, when we are stuck in that addiction, I mean, I, I, I was kind of looking for help, but at the same time, I was like, well, I'm just going to do this on my own, or I'm going to try again tomorrow, it's somehow thinking that magically it's going to be better than the last time I tried it. But yeah, we need. I, I, yeah. I feel like we need to get to a point. And what was that point for you, for you to actually start looking at finding someone that could help you? Um. I didn't, I didn't want to be alone the rest of my life. And I couldn't, um, i try and move this little. I couldn't do what I needed to do. I couldn't meet anyone. I wouldn't meet anyone. I didn't like me. I didn't like my, what I had done to my body. I liked me as a person. Yeah. I just didn't like what I had done to my body. So, and I, I was like, well, I, no one's going to want this. No one's going to want, it. I mean, come on. Right. So it, that's what got me really wanting help in, mm -hmm. and to really, and it was all focused on weight at the time. It was all yeah. focused on weight. Um, and so that's why I sought out that particular therapist, but two, it was about two years later that I was diagnosed with Hashimoto and I was, very sick at the time I had put on, I, I like sugar in my body. I just, re, I uh, hold on to edema mm -hmm. and I had so much edema in my body that if I crouched down, it felt like the skin on my legs would rip oh. and, and going upstairs, trying to breathe. It was around my heart, my lungs. It was everywhere. And I just, I was like, I need, I have to do something. And, and I, it was now we're talking about COVID time and I knew I had to go back into the school. I knew I had Hashimoto and getting that diagnosis was huge because I, I knew I was like, if I don't do something, I'm going to end up with a million other autoimmune conditions that much I knew. And so I started researching and that's what it got me. I did deep dive research. I needed to know what I had to do, what tests I needed to look at, what was going to help. And when I, that's, I kind of found carnivore and all that. And I found other people with Hashimoto and talked to hundreds. And I'm like, okay, the ones that got rid of their Hashimoto, I was like, what did you do? And they all did carnivore, no dairy. So that's what got me there. And with the addiction part of it, um, the carnivore helps you literally just get rid of the cravings. But when I was at my worst and my sickest and I'm going back into the school and I'm like, if I get COVID, I'm going to die. I had so much scar tissue in my lungs. I'd had from asthma and bronchitis and everything. Um, and I am like, if I catch this, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And I was going in the school. I went, I have done nothing this past year. Why didn't I do something when I could? And I looked at my granddaughter and she had been born under a pound and she's wow. a huge part of this. She should not, should not have survived. She is a miracle. And every single thing that takes preemies and babies lives did not take her. She had them all, but it didn't take her. And I kept looking at her and I was looking at me 
And I was so sick. And all I could think about was putting sugar in my mouth. And she, I, I just was like, I'm being selfish. And she has survived all of this, all these things that take a baby's life. And she's here and she's thriving. And, and here I am putting all this shit in my mouth. And I was like, if I don't do something, I'm, I'm not going to be here a year from now. I'm like, if I want to live past this next year, I have to do something. And thinking about her and what she had survived and knowing that if I don't do something, I'm going to die. I'm not, my heart's going to give out. And, and, and I was going back into a school with COVID. And the day I went back into the schools, the day I started, and it was uh, 2 one twenty one. And I started that day and I went, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to die. I don't know if I'm going to catch something. I wore my mask. Um, but it was that point that it all changed. And I knew at that point, I went, I can never have anything sweet again. Cause it's not just a sugar addiction. It's a sweet addiction. And I knew I could never, ever touch anything sweet because the sugar mind just takes over it controls everything and it'll try to convince you to take that one bite it will try to convince you tomorrow to start tomorrow you know we all know that we've all done it and yeah. and I knew that so it was getting through those first few weeks to get the sugar addicted part out and what I didn't realize after that was once you start healing all those old emotions start coming to the surface and you have to deal with them and no amount of meat and fat is going to deal with those. And while priming, uh, priming is great to get rid of all the cravings. It doesn't touch those emotions when they hit. And I could be nauseatingly stuffed, but when that hit, if I didn't have another coping mechanism other than my go-to, I, I was going to go down a rabbit hole and I would not succeed. Um, so I knew at that point, it wasn't about food. It was about doing anything and everything other than using food to deal with that emotion. Because even if I'm using the right food, it's still the same behavior. Yeah. So it became about, okay, let's put the audio books in the head. Let's stay motivated. Let's go for a walk. Let's get out into the trees where the energy is phenomenal. You know, let's anything other than food, because in those moments I wasn't hungry. I mean, ever since going carnivore, I'm not hungry ever. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sitting there going, I don't want anything, but yet my brain is going here. So each time I did something else, I got stronger. Every time I chose me. And that's a big part. I'm like, my granddaughter may have pushed me into this. I mean, in, in my mind, it's like her story, mm. but I had to become, I had to be important enough to me yes. in order to ever, ever beat this. And, and so when I'm talking to anyone else, it's like, you have to dig so deep inside of yourself to find that light, to find even a scrap of it and your worth. And you have to be important enough to yourself to, to lead. That's so good that you bring that up. And I would like you to expand on that a little bit, if you don't mind, because the self-worth, when you don't have it, you have no idea how to actually access it or find it. So how did you do that? Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, um, Because I'm saying find your worth. It's like if you have yeah. none. Yeah. Um, I, in my marriages and what I went through and, um, I did not feel like I was worth the dirt under his shoe. There was, there was none of that. And when I went to college, like when I had my, um, my son and he, he was born blind, he was born with so many issues and I go into all the therapies with him and then went to college. Cause I went, I need, I want to learn about speech, speech pathology and, and all that. And 
signing and I just wanted, I wanted it all and I wanted to learn. And I graduated with a, two bachelor's degrees with honors. And I went, I went, I'm good at this. I mean, I may feel like I'm not worth crap to anybody, but I went, I'm smart. I said, I'm really good at this. And so that kind of stuck with me. And even though I didn't, I couldn't look in a mirror, I couldn't, I didn't like what I saw. And even when I lost weight, I'd look in the mirror and see this big person. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And I still to this day have that issue, but I figure at some point the brain and the body is going to kind of catch up. And, but it was remembering that, remembering that I'm like, I am a really good person. I give everything of myself when I'm, whether it's a friend or, or a partner or it, like coaching anything. It's like, it's all of me. I am, I can't give part of me. And I know people say, keep these boundaries, you know, but I can't not be a friend if, if I'm working with someone and it's, it's everything And that. Of course, if people take, can take advantage of that um, relationships, all that, I get it. And it will happen. But at the same time, it's like, you still have to be you. And there's, there's been stuff going on recently. And even this morning, I wasn't sure I could talk to you today because I'm, it's, it's happening now. And it's something that I remember thinking, like, what would I say to you? Because I'm like, I'm in the middle of this uh, turmoil. And I went, it's, it can happen anywhere, anytime. And you, you don't know, but if you don't have the skills ahead of time, you're, you're going to go down that rabbit hole. And so I, even as it's been two years and even as long as it's been something like this hits me and I'm just like, there's no control. And that's, that's the hard part with me. If there's something that hits me that I cannot control in any way, it, it makes it very difficult. And my first thought (laughs) is, how, how can I stop this? And usually it's a food thing. Mm -hmm. And I am so far in that I would never have believed that my brain would go there, but because it's a different kind of stressor, it went there. Yeah, It went there. And I was like, okay, you're going to do what you're, what you tell other people to do. You're, you're going to do anything other than reach for food. And you're going to stay busy. You're going to stay motivated. You're going to go outside. If you need to go outside, um, I'm going to, and I call, I will call someone if I need to call someone and say, okay, just talk to me right now. I need to get out of my head. And it, it makes all the difference because the thing is, if you reach for your old go-to your old habit, you may or may not recover. And at at least for me, and is it going to be another three years until I can pull myself back up? And it was in that moment, (laughs) this is a crying day today. It was in in that. Let's cry. (laughs) That moment I'm going through it and I'm thinking, I went, I have to reach deep down inside of me and pull any glimmer of light that's in there because everything seems in the moment when you're going through it, it's like everything's so dark and it feels like there's no hope. And that's my thing. It's always been hope. You give hope Mm -hmm. and you hold on to hope. And in a moment when you feel like there is none, you somehow have to go really deep inside because you can't look outside yourself you can't look for people to give you that hope or or situations to give you that hope you have to find it inside yourself and I had to do that I had to really just be like it's in here it's all in here and and somehow that it brings peace but you have to believe it too you have to believe that deep, deep down inside of yourself, you can pull yourself up. 
and, and stay focused. You can pull yourself up. And even if you have to sit in the moment, because you can't not feel these things. If you, if yeah. you're trying not to feel them, that's like trying to bury them. And it's these exact emotions, these exact experiences that you just have to sit in them and maybe feel them for a moment, cry if you have to cry and be able to let them go. And I don't think you can let them go if you bury them. You just, and there's other ways to bury them. There's other kinds of addictions, you know? Yes. Um, and it's, it's a matter of not doing that because if you can feel it, if you can allow yourself to feel what you're feeling and then release it, then you can be free and you hold on to that mental freedom. I mean, you may not have had it in the moment, but you claim it back. And every time you can do that, you get stronger and, and stronger and stronger. And I mean, this most days, I mean, I can have a buffet around me and I don't want, I don't want it, you know, and, and I certainly wouldn't take a bite. It's like, I may have a mental memory of things, of foods and stuff, but I know I'm like, I take one taste and that's going to bring me back so far back. And I'm like, hell no. <laughs> it's like, no, no This way. is interesting. Have you ever relapsed since you started working with a therapist? Oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, yeah. When I started working with her, I wasn't even on track. It took her yeah. two years of going into the emotions and some of the connections that I had with the guilt, like a soul connection that I would speak of as a present, but yet it was past. And so many things that she had to go into first it was all about the emotions yeah and and I'd be doing great and I could speak a really good game at the time <laughs> and um and then I'd be back and I'd be off the call with her I'm doing great I'm like yep great mindset and two hours later I'm in a in a bag of whatever mm. yeah and I I'd think be like I mean, I, I don't see anyone quitting without relapsing. And I think it's an essential part of just breaking that addiction yeah. that we have to relapse. We have to look at what happened and do it with awareness so that we can learn something from it. And that's just part of the journey. That's my opinion, because that's what I see. And that's happening for everyone. And it's just happening less and less often until we get there. I don't know what your opinion yeah. on that is. Oh, no, no. I was, <laughs> I think I was eight or nine months in I felt very strong but the fall came and the fall is when the holidays start and the holidays yep. for me have always been like my mom and I would start in September okay what's the menu for Thanksgiving what's the menu for Christmas what are we doing and we get so entrenched in the menu of what we were making what we were buying it was all about food and it was all sweet food um that I wasn't prepared for I was so strong up to that second and I wasn't prepared for what I would feel in that moment. And I went to a uh, Gilmore girls fest <laughs> fan fest with uh, my daughter and it was uh, mid October or something. And I started tasting. I took one bite and I said, don't worry. As long as I don't eat candy, I'm good. As long as I don't buy candy, I am good. By the end of that weekend, I was bringing candy home from the candy store and I was on a two and a half month spiral. All the, I, it was just all sugar at that point, right straight through the holiday. Um, and so it was January of 22 that I had set up this huge contest with the school. It says, who wants to get ready for summer? You know, let's get healthy for summer. And I remember thinking, I went, I can't not do this. I'm going to look stupid. And so it was a saving grace because I knew. But the thing is, we're literally one meal away from being back on track. And <laughs> that's what it was. I, I, that day, I'm like, I'm right back at this. I got, okay, my weight went up some. I got all this edema. Let's get me on the scale. I don't want to lose. And it was, it saved, it saved me because, um, I couldn't not do it. <laughs> like, yeah. um, I couldn't, I couldn't not do it. So 
I did it. And I think I dropped like 70 pounds from there through June. And, um, yeah, so it was, it was great. And I knew, I knew that in that January moment, I was like, and my daughter told me, cause she watched the whole thing. And she goes, mom, she goes, you need to be able to go through the holidays without anything sweet. She goes, you can't have it. And I said, I know, I know. And that was the moment that I think I truly believed and knew without a doubt, I can never touch anything sweet again. I'd said it before, but I didn't, I'd had a sweetener here and there, I, you know, and sweeteners, let me tell you, they will take you down. They will bring you right back to sugar at some point if you in, involved in the, in the artificial sweeteners, especially depending on really, really how bad your sugar addiction is. Um, sweeteners are not your friend. And that changed everything though, knowing, truly believing, but knowing because of what I had just gone through that I could never have anything sweet again. And everything changed after that. I got, I was strong. I could face anything, but it doesn't mean that an emotion is not going to hit you to make you wobble. Yeah. And I still think even if it goes beyond a wobble that you have to pick yourself up, you still have to look inside you. You have to be important to you enough to say, okay, that happened. Yeah. I'm, this is why this happened. I wasn't prepared. I didn't have a skill for this. And you pick yourself up going forward and saying, when that hits me again, I know what to do. And, but there's always going to be something. There's always going to be um, a stressor that you're unprepared for. And it's just knowing what to do. And, and even if you don't know what to do, it's like, okay, find something new in that moment, you know, but don't, don't backtrack if, if at all you can help it. Yeah, and speaking of wobbles, um, people often think that they need to be motivated to quit. But I think motivation is kind of a little bit of a fairy tale, something that's a bit overrated because we're never going to mo be motivated 100% of the time. So I think no. that a better emotion to look for is commitment so that we're able to just follow through. So I'm I'm kind of a little bit curious, like, what did you do when you felt like the motivation wasn't quite there? Were you really just drawing on commitment or was there something else that was helping you to actually get back on track and stay on track and just do what you knew that you needed to do? Well, for me, um, my sole goal, I mean, weight was right up there, yeah. but my goal was to get rid of Hashimoto. Mm -hmm. And I knew, and I felt so much better. I mean, my pain was gone. The edema was gone. All Everything was gone. Um, but I knew I'm like, you, there is no other option. There is no other option for me. And that it's like my commitment to myself, my commitment to literally getting rid of Hashimoto because so many people have done it. And I said, I need to do this because I can't, how do I help someone else? How do I inspire someone else? If I'm not doing what it, what needs to be done to make it go away. And it's like, I do want to inspire other people. And so many, I've healed literally everything else in my body, but this is a beast. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, it's going to take a while. And I know that, and it, and it's okay because I know I'm not going to eat any other way. And it motivation isn't, that isn't what started this whole thing. And I've used motivation in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I can get, get to a certain point. And then of course I go there and then I'm right back up again. Yeah. Um, you can't do it for something outside of yourself. That's why when it's in here, yes, not about motivation, it's about your commitment to yourself. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's my health and I don't want to, I mean, I'm 60 years old and I don't want to go and be 80 or 90 and be like, okay, walking around with canes and, you know, needing all kinds of assistance or pills. I mean, no medication, none. And that's, what's important to me is to live fully. I mean, I wasn't living before I was existing. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't 
a life. It was just, I was here every day for my emotional pain, my physical pain. And I, and I just didn't want that anymore. Yeah. That's awesome. So when you sought out your therapist, do you mind just kind of telling people a little bit about <clears throat> what your therapist took you through and what someone who might look for a therapist that is specializing in addiction, what they would kind of be looking forward to or not I know uh she was good for a while there I was like it it almost was a lot like talking to a friend a lot of talking yeah. um but I remember when she was trying to pull me out of this one I call it a soul connection um because it was, it's, it's hard to describe. We, I could feel his energy. He could feel mine. We, if he would spiral, I would spiral, but I wouldn't know why. Um, so it was very, very intricately connected. And I hadn't, when I started seeing her, I hadn't seen him in probably nine years, but yet I spoke in the present. Like we talked, he would text to kind of pull me back in and, um, and of course I went, <laughs> but we hadn't seen each other and, but it was still very, very much present. It didn't leave. The energy didn't leave. And which was what made it so extremely difficult. And that control, it literally consumed my thoughts. It was as bad as the sugar addiction. I almost want to say it was a people addiction, mm. um, but it was not healthy at all. And she she that was the first thing she had to work through that and she said okay okay she says I want you to contact and say are we doing this or what and I went what <laughs> and I went, what do you mean and she goes <clears throat> he says he wants it you say you want it well let's let, just put it out there let's do it and I went okay <laughs> so that day I'm going home I went okay I gotta put this out there okay <laughs> and in my brain, I'm like, um, I started thinking about it. And I'm like, this is chaos. I just, do I want chaos? <laughs> I yeah. started th really thinking about it going, if I put this out there to him and he says yes, which no, <laughs> he's in his own trauma. And it was, but it was like at the time I went, if he says yes, I said, then I have to. I went, do I want to? Mm -hmm. Now, I've been stuck in this mode for a decade. And all of a sudden, I'm like, do I even want this? And it blew my mind. I was like, I didn't know what to do. If I didn't want this, what was I going to do? Everything would be gone. Everything that my soul focus and consuming me, keeping me busy in my head would be gone. Like, what am I going to do with myself? <laughs> and I'm like, um, do I want this? And I realized I didn't. I was like, so I don't good. want that chaos. I went, I don't want the chaos. And I went, oh my God, I've wasted a decade. And it was like, it wasn't over at that point. It wasn't over, but it broke through. Yeah. It broke through. And I was little by little, I was able to start letting go and I completely let go um I don't know must have been uh two years ago and he showed up at my door after 12 years and I didn't answer the door I was like mm, no mm -mm. and I was and the thing is everything in me was shaking everything and I was like didn't know what to do. And in, in exactly in those moments, that's something you do not predict. And I did not reach for food. I didn't, I mean, as soon as he left, all that was gone. And I was like, okay, I wasn't feeling me. I was feeling him. That was his energy. I went, okay, I'm good. And um, it was fine. I did end up having a conversation um, maybe a month later, face-to-face. -face. I says, I'm only doing this face-to-face. And I was such a completely different, stronger person than the person that accepted like being a doormat right. and accepted all that prior. And 
I was bold, spoke my mind. And it was like, I was so much stronger in here. And when that conversation was done, I was like, oh my God. And it's, it, that would not have happened without having to have dealt with like her pushing me, calling my bluff and then working through that and literally breaking apart all um, the barriers that I had inside of me, everything that was keeping me locked inside of me. Yeah. And then it's been opening because I would never go interviews. I mean, I Instagram, I, I wasn't doing any of that. And, um, but it was like all these things that kept me locked inside myself yeah. just started to fall away. And a lot of that was therapy. A lot of that was taking control of my own mind and my food. Um, it was a culmination of all of it though. It really was. And I don't think there was any clear cut way because every week my mind was different. So she adapted yeah. accordingly and she worked with what I was saying and she always brought it back to me. Instead of looking outside myself, she always brought it back to me. And so I learned, I learned how to deal with what I was feeling and deal with anything that would hit me, but deal with it from inside me and not rely on, you know, an outside person or a situation like, oh, if I just met someone, this would be better. Or if I just um, had a different job, or if I just did this, it, this would be better. And it's like, no, mm. it's all better inside here. Yes. And once it's better inside here, all those things are fine. You don't even need some of them. So yeah. That's awesome. I know it's not clear cut when it comes to the therapy, but yeah, it never is. Exactly. And it shouldn't be because we're all different. So uh, I'm yeah. glad to hear that. How long did you see her for? Hmm? How long did you oh, see, see her for? Um, four or five years. And she, we just ended in this past November. Yeah. Um, because of that point, scary. A little, because it was like, feel like I was losing my friend, mm. but not because, I mean, she said, well, she was, we've reached all the goals. She was, you've reached all your goals. She was, you're thriving. And she goes, look at you. She goes, you're in this community. You're helping people. She's the one that kept telling me, find community. Yeah. And I was like, no, no, no. I, I do this by myself. I can do this myself because I always had. And, and she says, you've done it yourself. She goes, but have you succeeded? I went, no. <laughs> and she always wanted me to find a group. Um, and I think the universe put this group in my path. I went to it. I wasn't sure about it at first. I started sharing in the community. I started healing within this community. I healed like the program of what it all made sense in my mind. Because if it doesn't make sense up here, I can't. I can't even uh, do it. And it all made sense. And um, it just, everything snowballed from there. And um, all the healing, I mean, I've healing things that I've just not even realized I had. And, you know, people say things, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I remember that. And I'm like, oh, it's gone. <laughs> so I add that to the list. Um, so, so much. And community was huge. It was really huge. And um, the SBG gang is um, very different because I was in Facebook groups mm. and the, a lot of drama, a lot of dogmatic um, ideas. And it, I just didn't like the negativity. So in this group, everyone's on the same page. Everyone's trying to heal and everyone's trying to help each other. Yeah. So like when the coaches would talk, <clears throat> you you get that information and everyone absorbs that information and they literally give it back to new members yeah so it's like it's one clear message um and it's not the same for everybody because everybody's different you know in their healing but the message is the same the message you know you can heal it listen to your body what does your body need yeah you know and it's so important absolutely so let me ask you if i put a a cake in front of you or something how much do you trust yourself now to not touch it 
Oh, I won't touch it. Like, oh. I don't even want it. I don't even yeah. want it. No, this been, I, I work in a classroom with autistic kids. Like they cook, <laughs> they're making cookies and they're making cakes and they order food in there's pizzas, there's everything. And yeah, it, it's just, it's not, it's not um, in my realm of possibility. It's not an option. Yes. Um, but, but not just not an option. That's what got me through a lot. Yeah. But uh, I don't want it. I don't want it. Yeah. That's and that, that's freedom. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same. I don't want it anymore. I have even yeah. gone and like, okay, maybe I should have some and see how I react because I like doing experiments. And I cannot, I just look at him like, no, that's not going to be good. That's not going to taste good. No, nothing is appealing anymore. And that feels yeah. so bloody good. And to choose to not have it just because it doesn't feel appealing at all, which is crazy. I know. I remember when, like when all the cravings were gone and one day I'm going, did I ever really like chocolate? Yeah. <laughs> I simply questioned it because I'm like, I'm not craving it. I don't want it. I'm like, I said, did I ever really like it? I'm like, what is that? Yeah. And it's the brain wanted it. Not I don't, and I don't, I shouldn't say the brain, the sugar mind wanted mm. it because the brain doesn't ever want that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I did what you said. I did experiment um, with heavy whipping cream mm. and cause everybody loves heavy whipping cream. So I had it at Christmas time and I says, it's still carnivore. I'm like, no, I should not have dairy. I have Hashimoto. It's going to inhibit that healing process, but I want to know what it was doing. Yeah. And so I had this cream and all of a sudden I'm off kilter. I I'm trying to walk and it's, I'm seriously concentrating to walk straight. And I went, my brain wow. is inflamed. What the hell? And it wasn't just that all the dairy had caused like the, the runny sinuses, the the breathing issues. Now, yeah. when I got off dairy, the CPAP went away, asthma went away, all the, the sinus stuff, all the breathing stuff went away. So I knew that about the dairy, but I didn't understand the other part. Can you and have and I also heard that, huh? Can you have butter or is that included in dairy? Yeah, I can have butter. butter. Yeah. It's processed into a fat, so it's it's completely different. Yeah. Um, it's... Yeah, that some people are sensitive to it. I'm not. Yeah. I mean, but it's fine. Cool. But the cream, when I did that experiment, I was like, I have not felt this in two years. I did not know two years ago what was causing it. I had no idea. I didn't know what, because I, I was eating everything. So I didn't know what was causing what. I just eliminated it all. Yeah. And now I have even not just the breathing issues, but um, but the brain swelling and I'm just like, that's not okay. I thought because I had had sciatica and my muscles had been atrophied, which they're great now. I thought that that's what was causing the imbalance. And then I had to really focus like walking down the hallways to just walk straight. And it wasn't that, it wasn't that it was the cream. Yeah. And wow. I'm like something so little. So I do share that story a lot because people are so entrenched in the dairy. It's, it's a yep. good, if you're going to carnivore and you're going from where a whole, whole, all kinds of food, it's like dairy is a great transition because yep. it's different. It's not just all meat. So by all means use it to start, but with autoimmune issues, it's once you get past the sugar cravings, it's like, it has to go. Um, and I was, I was talking to Bart, I sent him a, a message about uh, dairy and iodine because everyone's on this whole iodine kick and yeah. iodine, I took it and it was like my TSH went up, my antibodies went up, that iodine went through the roof and I only had a teeny bit. And I was like, and there was one day I was doing a search on um, iodine salt and all up come all this stuff about dairy, this iodine and dairy. And, and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, is it? Oh my God, everyone's doing this overconsumption of dairy when they go keto or carnivore because Lord knows you can make chaffles and everything else with dairy. Yeah. And I went, is this why all the people with the autoimmune issues who are also supplementing because everyone's telling them to, they're already getting plenty of iodine in the dairy. 
And then they're supplementing and then things are going wonky. They're wondering why their hair is falling out or they're gaining weight and mm. stuff. And it's like, holy cow. But it's there's a direct connection with like the TPO antibodies. They go up if you take iodine. Um, and it's something to do with the hydrogen peroxide level. But I just, all these connections when I started like doing this and, and especially like when I did the dairy and I went, or the whipping cream, sorry. Yeah. And I'm just like, Oh my God. So I said, I need to ask some brilliant minds <laughs> this question just to figure out. So I got to figure out this triangle yeah. because I, I, I'm sorry, but when someone says something that everyone across the board should do, that's a red flag for me yep. because everybody's different. I love Dr. Berry, but he says everyone should have iodine. And that's not true. That's not true. It affects different people that shouldn't have it because of a hydrogen peroxide level. And uh, Dr. Bright says it too. Only her, she says it in very large doses. Mm. So I have problems with anything that's spread across the board. Um, Me too. But other <laughs> other stuff, you know what I mean? Other stuff yeah. is great. Like that they're saying it's not everything. It's just those kind of things because every body is different. Yes. So. And on that note, we're going to wrap up a little bit. So do you have any okay. last words of wisdom that you want to share with people who feel like you know it's going to be too hard to do I'm really stuck in this do you have any tips yeah <laughs> yeah <many>. um, <laughs> considering where I came from to where I am it's like that's a miracle in and of itself yeah so I know because of that like anyone can get here yeah but I understand when you're in the middle of it you're in the middle of your mind controlling you, it's completely different. And you, you have to be ready and you have to want to heal. It can't just be about weight because carnivore, carnivore is not about weight. Um, it's about healing and yeah, the weight will go afterwards, but you have, you have to be important enough to yourself. And when you're getting started, if you're truly ready to get started, you have to accept that you can't have sweet again in in any form i mean i know some people think they can have fruit and stuff like that but that can lead it just it triggers those centers in the brain anything that's sweet and anything especially if it's got sugar or fructose but once you accept that and it, it you go through a mourning process because those foods you were eating, whether it's car carbs turned to sugar. So carbs, sugar, same thing to me. Um, those things, it's like, it's been like a friend and they, they helped you. They helped you not feel things you didn't want to feel. And so to let that go feels like you're losing your best friend. Yeah. And so you mourn that. And I mourned it for weeks. And then after mourning came acceptance and that, is what changes everything because you can say it, but if you don't believe it, then always in the back of your mind, you'd be like, well, maybe just at Christmas, I'll have something maybe just at this point. If you have that going on in your mind, you don't succeed long-term. And maybe you have that going on in the beginning and then you learn, no, I can't because maybe you fumble. Cause I had that in the back of my brain in the beginning. And I stumbled and I went through that two and a half month long spiral to get to the point of accepting mourning, you know, mourning and then accepting I couldn't have it. That acceptance changes everything. That's what gives you mental freedom. It, and there is nothing worth more than that mental freedom. It is priceless. And the only way you get it, because no one can do it for you. You have to do it yourself. Yeah but it can be done. Absolutely. And I just want to add to that, that I'm actually helping people reprogram their brains so that they can actually have something. But as you say, you have first have to accept it and be in full acceptance. And then you can actually learn to be someone who can moderate because I can do that now. So it's not impossible if you want to go there, but you cannot start there. <laughs> You have to get yeah. to the acceptance point of just truly wanting to let it go. Once you're there, 
the world's your oyster. But wow. it's a journey. Yeah, it's something that you need to do. Like you need to take the time to reprogram your brain to actually act and react that way and think in a different way. Because if we just want to do Christmas because we want to satisfy that itch that we have, that's not going to work. That's right. not that's not the motivation that we want to ha have behind that. So if people want to connect with you, where can they find you? On Instagram, I am Carnivore Angel Healing on Instagram. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sally. I have thoroughly Thank enjoyed you. listening to your story. And I'm excited to see where you're going next and where you're going to take your Hashimoto's. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much too. I appreciate it. You're welcome.